Well, Happy New Year, IEC. It's good to see everyone here today. Uh, if you were here with us last week, you know we've started a new series. This series is on making disciples. If you're new here, traditionally, we will go through books of the Bible. We'll work our way chapter by chapter, verse by verse through a book of the Bible because our heartbeat is to hear what does God have to say to us? We're not looking to hear from a man. We want to hear from God Almighty. Well, for the next few weeks, for the month of September, we're going to be focusing on our mission statement as a church. Our mission statement as a church, we say we are a church to make disciples of all nations for the glory of God. That's our purpose. That's our heartbeat. We celebrate that God has brought many nations to us, and we want to follow Jesus strategy, his plan. So over the next three weeks in particular, we're going to look at three claims or calls that Jesus has upon his disciples. Today we're going to look at what would be the earliest of those calls that he has upon his disciples will be in John's gospel. This is Jesus' first encounter with his disciples recorded in scripture. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you, turn to John chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 35 through 51. John chapter 1, verse 35 through 51. If you would please stand for the reading of God's good word. It reads, The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard this and they followed Jesus. Uh, Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, uh, you, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. And all God's people said, praise be to God. You may be seated. God, you say in your word that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Lord, we acknowledge that unless you speak, nothing of significance will be spoken here today. So speak, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. What we see today is Jesus encountering four of his disciples. We see four very ordinary men 
who encounter Jesus and we get to see the reaction. So here's what we're going to see. It'll be in the screen behind me. First, we're going to see John the Baptist. And he's going to invite the crowds to come and see Jesus. Then we're going to see Jesus invites Andrew to come and see. Andrew is going to invite his brother to come and see. Philip invites his friend to come and see. And finally, we'll see Nathaniel. He comes to see who Jesus is. First, we, we start off today and we see John the Baptist, the forerunner to Jesus. John's ministry was a unique ministry. He did not start his ministry in an easy place. If you wanted to start a ministry where you knew that the crowds were and was going to be easy to gather people, you'd go to Jerusalem. You'd go to somewhere where there was a crowd. Instead, John goes to the desert. He goes to a very difficult, hard-to-get-to place, a place where there's very little water, a place where you can't get food easily, and that's where John's ministry takes off. And crowds come, and they gather around John to hear what he has to say. And John, notice this. In verse 35, it says, He was standing with two of his disciples. So John the Baptist had disciples of his own. That, that was the primary method of training, of building up, of shaping. You see, the goal of having a disciple wasn't for them to merely know what their teacher knew. No, it wasn't just to have information in their head. The goal of being a disciple was to become like the master. Luke 6.40 says, Everyone who is fully trained will be like the master. That's the goal, is to become like them. So it's not just to have more information, to learn more. It's to be transformed, all your life transformed, your whole life changed. And two of these disciples were with John the Baptist. He looks at Jesus as he walks by, and John says these words, Behold the Lamb of God. Now, in John's Gospel... It starts off with the first week of uh, an early week of Jesus' ministry. We get seven days in succession. We get four days, and then it skips three and goes to the wedding at Cana. We are in day three of a week in Jesus' ministry. On day two, Jesus encountered John the Baptist, and John said these words Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, it's easy for us to become a little numb to those words. We've heard them before, most of us. Jesus, the Lamb of God, comes to take away the sins of the world. But for a Jewish mindset, for a, 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 a Jewish person living at this time in Hebrew, your entire desire was to see the Lamb of God. You see, the Lamb of God is all over the Old Testament. As soon as sin enters the world, Adam and Eve... Genesis 3, the first thing they do is they seek to cover their sin with fig leaves, their own works, their own religious practices, their own attempt to say, we're going to cover sin. Mankind's always doing that. We're always seeking to cover sin in our own way. Maybe if I do enough good things. That's the general belief of many people in our world today. Basically, if you're pretty good, You'll be in right standing with God. But that's not what Scripture teaches. Our sin has separated us from God. And we can't do enough good works. And God comes and looks at Adam and Eve and rejects their fig leaves. And in Genesis 3.21, he covers them with animal skins. Now, wearing an animal skin requires a few things. First, it requires an animal to die. And God teaches Adam and Eve right there at the beginning, your sin deserves death. But God, in his grace, he will take someone else, something else, and let it be a substitute for your sin. And Adam and Eve wore a bloody animal carcass, reminding themselves, we deserve death. Instead, we're covered by the blood of this animal as we roam around. Later we see uh, 
Abraham take his son Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice, and God rejects Isaac as a sacrifice. He's not sinless. Instead, a ram, a male lamb, is killed in his place. And we learn this. God will substitute the blood of the lamb for the sin of a man. Then in the Exodus, the families take an animal and sacrifice that. And we learn that God will take the substitute of a lamb for the family. And then in Leviticus, we learn that God will take the substitute of a lamb for the nation. But the problem with these lambs in the Old Testament is you had to sacrifice it year after year after year because it was insufficient. It would only cover for a little while. And God wanted people to be reminded, your sin deserves death. So finally, here comes Jesus. And John the Baptist looks and he says, Behold! Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins, not just of the individual man, not just of the family, not just of the nation. He takes away the sins of the entire world. When Jesus hung on the cross, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that he became sin. He became sin and he absorbed the wrath that your sin and my sin deserves. His sacrifice is sufficient for all mankind in all time. It's effective for those who will believe. So when John says these words, these disciples of John the Baptist, their ears perk up. The Lamb of God. He takes away the sins of the world. There he is. That's everything they've been looking for. Everything they've been hoping for is the Lamb of God. So, of course, we see these two men in verse 37 instantly begin to follow Jesus. One of the things I love about John the Baptist and his ministry is his heartbeat toward Christ. John's ministry is a good example for each of us here. In John 3.30, it says this, He must increase. I've got to decrease. That's the heart of any follower of Jesus. That should be the heart of any minister of the gospel. And let me tell you this, I believe firmly in the priesthood of all believers. That means if you're a Christian and you're here today, you are called to ministry. Our ministries may look different based on gifting, based on opportunity, based on experiences, based on things, but every single person is called to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ if you are born again, redeemed Christian. But your ministry is to be like John the Baptist. Look at him. Behold the Lamb of God. Look toward Jesus. I'm not trying to draw attention to myself. I'm not trying to make people look toward me. I'm not trying to gain acclaim or recognition. I'm not trying to attach to some institution where people know me. No, look to Jesus. That's what any faithful ministry looks like, continually pointing to Jesus. And that's what John the Baptist does. And I love this. John has two of his disciples. And he looks at them and says, Behold the Lamb of God. That word behold, it's not just like look. It's not just like glance. It's not just pay attention to. It's take hold of all that that person is. Behold, the Lamb of God is here. And I love that John doesn't do this. John doesn't go, hey, you guys are my disciples. You, you need to stay with me. Don't, don't, don't go follow Jesus. No, realize the point of discipleship is this. That we become more like Jesus. And we help others become more like Jesus. The point is Christ's likeness. You see, discipleship is not just to learn from the master. It's to become more and more like the master. As we're transformed through this. So here, these two guys begin to follow. And in verse 36, Jesus turns and he sees them and he asks them a question. It seems like a simple question. In some ways, it seems like a very... A little rude question. He turns to him and goes, what are you seeking? These two disciples start walking after Jesus. In this time, if you saw a rabbi that you wanted to follow, you couldn't just walk up to him and go, hey, can I follow you? No, the rabbi would look to you and go, hey, I think you have what it takes to become like me. You can follow me. So for the schooled traditional rabbis of Israel at this time, they would only take the brightest, the best, those that they could fill their heads with as much information as possible, that were intelligent enough to do that, and said, you can follow me, you can be like me. 
Jesus looks to four ordinary men today and says, hey, you can be like me. So he turns to them and asks them this question. It seems rude. What are you seeking? This is the first words of Jesus Christ in John's gospel. I think that's not by accident. What are you seeking? That's a question. It's not just a surface level question. It's a question every one of us need to ask ourselves. What am I really seeking? What are my affections really attached to? Am I seeking assurance? Are these guys seeking position by being a follower of Jesus? Are they seeking maybe excitement, the thrill of a lifetime? Maybe they're seeking to escape something. Affirmation. Maybe they're seeking experience, security. But it's a question all of us have to answer. What is it that we are seeking in this life? Every human heart will gravitate and seek something. Everybody's seeking. The question is, what are, we, what are we seeking it in? And Jesus turns and asks this brilliant question to these guys. What are you seeking? And they respond to Jesus, Rabbi, where are you staying? They didn't really answer his question. <laughs> where are you staying? But how you spoke to a rabbi was often in the art of question and answer. You would ask a question, they would ask a question, and you would converse in that. It was a unique way of conversing. So, for example, if a rabbi said, what is two plus two? You would say, well, what's a hundred divided by 25? You've answered the question with another question showing that you can arrive at the same conclusion. That's the way rabbis spoke. So these untrained guys look and go, ah, well, where, where are you staying? They ask a question. I heard the story of a team that was in Israel touring, and they were going through Jerusalem, and they roamed into a shop filled with paintings. And there was this old rabbi sitting on a stool. These were his paintings. And one of the women approached him and said, Are these your paintings? He said, Yes, they are. And she said, Which? is your favorite. And he responded to her, do you have children? Which is a peculiar question when somebody says, which is your favorite? He goes, well, do you have children? And she says, yes, why? So she was playing along with another question. He said, well, which is your favorite child? He answered her question. Which is your favorite painting? He brought her to the same conclusion. So that's often how rabbis would teach and walk with people and explain things. And here they're playing along. They answer the, they answer the best question they can come up with is, is, where are you staying? They want to go with him. They want to be with him. This is their way of saying, we want to come see what's going on. When Jesus gives them a simple but brilliant invitation, this is his first invitation to his followers. Come and you will see. Jesus' first invitation to his disciples is simple. Come and see. Jesus doesn't answer. Hey, listen, let me explain what the Lamb of God is. I am the Messiah. I've come into this world to die for the sin of humanity. And you're going to follow me. No, he didn't give them the whole plan. He didn't explain all that. He gives them a simple answer. Just come and see. And we're told that they came and saw and they stayed with him till about the 10th hour. In Scripture, the 10th hour... That's the same as the Ethiopian clock. Tenth hour in the afternoon, which I would call 4 p.m., is the same as the tenth hour in Scripture. So these guys, I would love to know what they saw when they talked to Jesus. What it was like being with him that first day that they were following. Now we get the identity of these two disciples. And remember, these are John the Baptist's disciples. One of them is the author of this book a man named John, who most believe was the youngest disciple. And interesting, John is Jesus' little cousin. So Jesus most likely knew John for a long time. Jesus probably knew John from the day he was born. Jesus had seen John grow up probably at family reunions and things. And John's the one who writes this book. He's a, he's a follower of John the Baptist first. The other is Andrew. 
Now, both of these guys have something in common. They're both disciples of John the Baptist, and they are both little brothers. So you have these two younger brothers following John the Baptist. They begin to follow Jesus. And I love Andrew's response in verse 40. It says, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. Andrew in verse 41, he finds his brother and he said, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. What is Andrew's first response to Jesus? I've got to go tell somebody. I've, I've got to go find my brother. And what's interesting is we don't hear very much of Andrew in, the, in Scripture. His older brother, Simon, he'll become far more famous. His ministry will be far more recognized. Simon will write two books. They're not called First and Second Simon. No, Jesus changes Simon's name here. He changes it to Peter, meaning the rock. His name was Simon, meaning to, to obey. And God, Jesus looks at him and says, you're going to be more than obey. You're going to be the rock upon which the disciples will be built, upon which the church will be started there in Acts. And Peter, will his fame will far exceed that of Andrew. But here's what I love about Andrew. We get three encounters with Andrew in the New Testament. And every time he's doing the same thing, he's always bringing somebody to Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Andrew, his, his, the one thing we get about in Scripture, he's always bringing people to Jesus. Wouldn't you love that to be said of you? The first step in discipleship is evangelism. Evangelism is a part of discipleship. When we talk about discipleship here, when we say our uh, mission as a church is to, is to disciple all nations for the glory of God, we're not just talking about a Bible study for all the nations, for all the peoples. No, we're talking about sharing the gospel. Evangelism is the starting place of discipleship. And that's where Jesus starts with these guys. Notice Andrew comes and sees. And his response is, I'm going to go tell my brother that I found the Messiah. He believes Jesus is the Messiah. He's been what we would call born again, converted, a new creation. Those are all terms in Scripture for what happens when we trust in Christ. We're a new creation. So he has placed his faith in Jesus Christ. He is trusted in him, and his immediate response is to go and tell his brother. He starts with his family. I, I love how we get a picture of family here. Jesus has a little cousin that's going to be one of his disciples. Andrew goes and tells his brother. His brother, who's impulsive at times, who has a very big personality, who will be the leader of the disciples, he goes and gets him. Sometimes those that God calls us to, their ministries may exceed the ministry God calls you to in terms of recognition, fame, people applauding. You see, discipleship is not about us. It's about us pouring ourselves into another person for the glory of God and pointing them to Jesus and helping them do ministry. We want to mature people to the point that they can do ministry themselves. But it starts with a simple invitation of come and see. If you are a follower of Christ here today, know this. You are called to do the work of evangelism. Evangelism means we go and we share the gospel, the good news of Christ, with those who don't know it. There's a lot of different ways to share the gospel. Some of you have probably taken classes on how to share the gospel, how to do evangelism. Some of you have taught classes on how to do that. There's lots of great ways to do that. And Scripture says that some people have the gift of evangelism. Not everybody does. But everyone is called to do the work of evangelism. That's something that we're all called to. God calls us to that. But his first example is a very simple example of evangelism. It's not, hey, you've got to have all these verses memorized, be able to answer everybody's question and have a plan for every comeback they'll have. No, it's simple. Come and see. Just come and see Jesus. Come and see a people 
who we're not perfect, we still struggle in our sin, but we worship a perfect Savior who has transformed us, who's given us purpose, who's given us meaning in life. Come and see our risen Savior. The reality is, is I can't save anybody and neither can you. None of us have the ability to bring salvation to anyone. Our job is to faithfully declare the gospel. Our job is to faithfully say, come and see. And God is the one who does the work. But I'll tell you, there's no greater joy in life than to see God use you, because he's God, to bring someone to himself. That's thrilling. That's a great joy. And we praise God for it because you know it's not you. He just used you because you made yourself available. And that's what Andrew does. He just simply says, come and see. Well, the next day, Jesus goes up to Galilee and he tells Philip, follow me. Philip is from Bethsaida, it says in verse 44, the city of Andrew and Peter. So these disciples, many of them had grown up together. Andrew and Peter grew up in Bethsaida. It's a little fishing village on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, about 200 people. So they certainly knew Philip. They played with Philip growing up. They'd hung out with Philip. And Philip's first response He goes and finds Nathanael. He goes and finds his friend. Now, the the word for found here that is used both when Andrew says we found the Messiah is the word that Jesus uses in a parable where he says there's a man who finds a treasure in a field and he goes and buys the field to get the treasure. He sells everything. When we find the treasure of Jesus Christ, all that this life has to offer pales in comparison. We'll leave it all behind to follow Jesus. And that's what Nathaniel does. He goes and, I mean, that's what Philip does. He goes and finds Nathaniel. And he tells Nathaniel, hey, we found the one who Moses, the law and the prophets speak of. Now, notice how he's speaking to Nathaniel. Nathaniel's an intellectual guy. Nathaniel's very studious. He studies the word of God a lot. And he's a bit of a skeptic. Like, if you're going to tell him something, it's got to line up with what he believes is accurate. Philip, I imagine, was a little intimidated by his friend who he knew was maybe more intelligent than him. I don't know if you've ever been there. God calls you to share the gospel with somebody, but you go, I know this person knows more than me. I know they're going to throw all sorts of questions at me. I'm not prepared. I can't handle this. I can't do this. Well, that's where Philip is. And he goes and says, we found the ones that the entirety of Scripture speaks to. Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel's instant response is, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth is never mentioned in the Old Testament. What do you mean you're telling me that the Messiah has come from Nazareth? That's not, Scripture doesn't talk about that. That doesn't fit. But get Philip's answer. His answer is not this. Well, 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 maybe he was actually born in Bethlehem and we just hadn't figured that out yet. Maybe we don't know all the story. He doesn't start there at all. He just says, says these simple words. Come and see. Just, just come and see. And I think based on the fact that Nathaniel had a relationship with Philip, he came and saw. There's a beauty in evangelism where we build a relationship with a person and we, fall, and we develop a heart for them and a love for them. And as we do, we want them to know and love our Lord and Savior because we love Jesus. And we know they don't know him. That's what we want for them. That's what we desire for them. So Nathaniel simply goes, okay, I'll come and see. Simple invitation. Nathaniel, now, now where we're going right now, this conversation's about to get really peculiar. It's a strange conversation, and there's some different interpretations of it, but I think we, we can maybe see a little bit of what's going on under the surface here. Nathaniel sees, Jesus sees Nathaniel, and here's what he says, Behold, an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. Now that's not too pr- impressive of a statement. Here's an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. But Nathaniel's response is this, How do you know me? Nathaniel's response is much weightier than what Jesus seemingly says. Everybody around was an Israelite. It wasn't hard to say there's an Israelite and there's no deceit. You'd think 
Nathaniel might go, well, well, thank you for the compliment. He doesn't do that. He goes, how do you know me? There's something going on that he goes, you know me. And Jesus says these words, before Philip called you, while you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now that doesn't seem like that bold of a statement either. I saw you under a tree. But listen to what Nathaniel does. Nathaniel goes, Rabbi, look, he's moved up. He didn't even refer to Jesus by any title. Now he goes, Rabbi, refer to him as a teacher. And he goes, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. For this skeptical guy, all of a sudden, Jesus goes, Israelite who knows there's no deceit, I saw you under a tree. And he goes, you're the Messiah. You're, you're, you're the king of Israel. But here's what Jesus is doing. Jesus meets Nathanael right where he is. Jesus is so faithful to meet us right where we are, right with the things we're wrestling with, to come and speak to us in a way that we understand. Everybody else may not get it, but he comes and he meets us there, and that's what he does with Nathanael. You see, the fig tree was a place where you would go to read Scripture, or you would go to meditate on Scripture. So it was very common for a thinker, for an academic type, to go find a fig tree and just sit there. And they would sit there and they would think about all sorts of things. They'd process God and think about God. And that's what Nathaniel was doing. But Jesus didn't just see Nathaniel with his eyes. He saw the heart of Nathaniel. He saw what was going on below the surface in Nathaniel. He saw what Nathaniel was actually thinking and processing. Look at this in verse 50. Jesus says, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You're going to see greater things than these. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. For those of you who've studied Scripture, studied Genesis in particular, does this bring any image to mind? Angels ascending, descending? Genesis 38. There's a man named Jacob who has a vision of angels ascending and descending. The name Jacob, it means supplanter. Because Jacob would come and through trickery and through deceit supplant his brother. He would take his brother's position. But God comes to Jacob and says, you're not Jacob anymore. You're Israel. The name Israel means to wrestle with God. You're one who's going to wrestle with God. And that's literally what Jacob did. Now what was the first thing that Jesus said to Nathanael? Behold, an Israelite. Behold, a man who wrestles with God in whom there's no deceit, in whom there's no Jacob. Well, if Nathaniel was sitting under that tree, processing Jacob's ladder, processing the work that God did in Jacob's life, how God came and changed this tricky, deceitful man and turned him into one who wrestles with God, and Jesus sees that and goes, there's an Israelite. There's one who wrestles with God and whom there's no Jacob. How do you know me? Saul, what was going on in your heart, in your mind, as you sat under that tree? Teacher, rabbi, you're the son of God. You're, you're the king of Israel. No one could know that. Unless he was from God. Unless he's Messiah. And Jesus says, you're going to see far greater things than these. I love this first encounter that Jesus has with his disciples. Some of them he probably knew before. But this is his first call upon them, and it's simple. Simply come and see. Sometimes evangelism is that simple. Go to your brother. Go to your family. Go to your friend. Point him to Messiah, a life transformed, and simply say, come and see. And God does the work. 
Nathaniel was a skeptic. We don't see Philip argue with him. We don't see Philip try to persuade him intellectually. All Philip does is say, come and see. And Jesus takes care of the rest. Beautiful invitation. Church, I pray that that will be the invitation on our hearts and minds that we'll simply say, come and see. Nearly 20 years ago, a friend who I worked with invited me, he said, you've got to come and see this Bible study I'm in, this guy I'm meeting with. Some of you heard me talk about him. His name is Roy Campbell. We affectionately call him Soup. My friend had just met with Soup once. And he said, hey, you've got to come with me. So the very next week, Tuesday morning, 5 a.m., I showed up in a neighborhood that I would typically never go in. And there I sat at Soup's table for the next three and a half years, traveling with him. And he didn't just say, I'm going to teach you how to be a man of God. He never used those words. He said, I will show you. I will show you with flesh and blood what it looks like to be a man of God. And as I sat around that table, as I traveled the world with Soup, as I went on, on trips with him all over the country, I saw what it looks like to be a man of God. And then I, I remember a, a couple weeks later, Soup said to me, he said, hey, come to my house Monday at noon. I had no idea why. I just said, okay, I'll be there. And I showed up and Soup said, this is the man who disciples me. And it was this man in his 70s named Herb Hodges. And during the same time I was sitting at Soup's table on Tuesday mornings, every Monday at noon, I sat at the table of Herb Hodges as the man who was discipling me was learning from the guy who was discipling him. But it all started with a simple invitation. A friend who I knew, loved, and trust, he saw his life transformed by somebody who discipled him, and he just said, come and see, and I said, I'll come and see. And I can tell you, my life's never been the same. I was already a Christian. I'd already trusted in Jesus, but I didn't understand discipleship. I didn't understand ministry. It, it wasn't what I was living for fully like that. But I got to watch it. I got to see it. And that's what Jesus did with these guys. Three and a half years, they watched. They saw. They learned. They just didn't know what Jesus knew. They became like Jesus. And that's what we're to become like. So I want to ask you, have you come to see who Jesus is? Have you trusted that he is the Messiah? Have you seen clearly that, hey, what am I seeking? I'm seeking Jesus. Everything I'm seeking can be found in Christ. And whatever I'm seeking that can't be found there is something that I'm seeking that's not of eternal weight or value. Now, all that we're seeking is found in Jesus Christ. And church, I pray that we are a people marked as those who seek Christ and that we be a church that celebrates evangelism, that first step in discipleship, and that though it may scare you to share your faith, though you may be uncertain, though you may go, I can't do it, that's a great place to be because you can't do it. Only Jesus can do it. But he's going to do it through you. Jesus has chosen to work primarily through his saints, through his people. He says, I want you to take the message. I want you to invite people to come and see. So church, we hope to, from time to time, offer evangelism trainings. I like evangelism trainings. I learn from them. Some of you have ways that you do evangelism. Many of you have different ways you do it, and that's great. But I love that Jesus makes it really simple for us. Come and see. I pray that'll be the cry of our hearts. Let's pray. God, I thank you. Thank you that we can look and how you met these first four disciples. You didn't tell them your whole plan. You didn't tell them everything that you wanted them to know, everything you wanted them to do. You didn't even tell them to clean up their act and change. You just said, come. Come just as you are. So they came. And then you invited them to see, to behold the Lamb of God, to see who you are. 
And Lord, may that be our cry to a world that's dying, to people that don't know the Savior. May we simply say, come, come, and you'll see. And then may we trust you to do the work. Lord, you've placed us in different spheres, different jobs, different homes, different neighborhoods, different personalities, different giftings. And you've given us places where we can be salt and light. So may we be faithful to declare to those around us, come and see the risen Savior. Lord, I pray if there's any here who, today who do not know the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, that you would do the work that only you can do. Lord, your word is effective and powerful, so we trust it to do the work you desire for it to do. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen.